I had just sat down. It had just ticked over five o'clock, Friday afternoon, start of a long weekend. And it had been one of those long weeks at work. The sort of week at work where you're hanging out for the end of it and a nice cool beverage on the Friday afternoon. I'd finally got there, just sat down with my wife for this ice cool beverage, for me, gin and tonic. And then my phone went off. And it was a message from my sister. Now she lives, lives up in North Auckland. And she mentioned to me that, that it had started to rain where they are and how that's a bad omen for the start of the weekend. Now my name's Luke Harrington and I'm a physical climate scientist. Now my friends, they tell me that I must have spent all day staring at the sky and counting clouds. My family, I'm pretty sure they think I'm a washed up poor man's Jim Hickey. Didn't quite make it to the big, big time of the six o'clock weather forecast. But they do know that I can actually read a weather forecast. And so sure enough, my sister asked me what's going on. And I duly obliged. I checked the Met Service rain radar and the weather forecast. And I told her there was a band of thunderstorms passing over. But it should be moving pretty quick and not too much to worry about. Anyway, I get back to my drink, have another sip. And then five minutes later, I get another message. My sister says that the rain isn't slowing down, it's actually getting worse. Another five minutes later, another message. This time, my sister says that their back lawn is starting to flood, and it's never happened before in the 10 years they've been living there. I'm starting to get a little bit concerned now, enjoying my drink a little less. And then another 10 minutes later, I get another notification, and this time it's a video of water flowing off their back lawn onto their back deck and into their living room. And in a little less than an hour, the time it took me to try to enjoy an after work drink on a Friday afternoon, my sister and her family had to evacuate from their home. They were one of thousands of families who had to make that same choice that day, January 27th, 2023. Now within a few hours, Auckland was in a state of chaos. It's important to remember that thunderstorms are quite tricky to forecast. And on this occasion, what was supposed to be passing by, instead the thunderstorm stalled over an area no more than 10 kilometers wide. And it continued to deliver persistent, heavy, extreme rainfall over that area. Unfortunately, that 10 kilometer wide zone happened to sit right on top of our largest city in New Zealand. Not only was it the worst possible place that this could have happened, but it was also the worst possible time. At the end of the working week, start of a long weekend, I don't even want to ask if you've been stuck in traffic in Auckland at that time of day. We know what happens. The commuters, they're at a standstill. And so as the rain continued to fall, the drainage system started to fail and the damages rapidly accumulated. Now, over at Auckland Airport, you might remember the photos of, you know, water in the departures lounge a foot deep. There's also very good rainfall records out at the airport hourly data going back to the 1950s. And if you look at those records, you'll see that the previous 24-hour record that was broken within three hours on Auckland Anniversary Weekend. Now, that's what climate scientists would call a record-shattering event. Now, if you take a step back for a second, look at a bit of broader context. In 2020, we broke a new record for the total amount of insured financial losses caused by extreme weather. Over that 12-month period, we got to about $250 million of insured losses. The following year, in 2021, we broke that record again. This time we got up to about $300 million of insured losses. And then in 2022, start to get a bit of a pattern here, we broke that record again. This time over the 12-month period, collective insured losses across the country from extreme weather were about $350 million. So you got 250, 300, 350. Now, the latest estimate of the insured losses from this one event, Auckland Anniversary Weekend Floods, are about $1.9 billion. So that's five times larger than the previous record over a 12-month period for the entire country within about three or four hours. How does this happen? Well, unfortunately, thanks to climate change, it's not just the rare events that are becoming likely, but it's the impossible events that are also becoming plausible. Well, that's all well and good, but what do I mean by that? Well, a few factors to note. First, we know that a warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. You might have heard of this one before. This is what we call the thermodynamic response to climate change. All things equal, what that should mean is these storm systems should deliver more rainfall. 
Second, the oceans are heating up. The oceans actually absorb 90% of the additional energy in the atmosphere due to greenhouse gas emissions. And that means two things. One, more moisture to deliver into this warmer atmosphere, but also more heat energy to strengthen the storm systems that occur. And third, we know that the dynamics of these, particularly these short duration storm systems are also changing in a number of ways, but what we know is basically the speed with which the moisture gets converted into rainfall within these storm systems is also speeding up. So when you combine these three factors together, what you'd find is that if similar weather conditions were to occur in a world without climate change, we would expect probably 15 to 20 percent less rain to have fallen out than what we saw in 2023, and that's because of the additional 1.2 degrees of global warming that we've seen. There's another thing that we need to take into account. Even when you take that additional 20 percent of rain and you chop it off the top of that Auckland anniversary flooding event, it still broke all previous records. So how is that possible? Well, it's relative to past records, relative to what we've seen previously. Therein lies the clue. Past experiences are actually not the best way to gauge what could happen or what we could see, both in the current climate and also in the future. Now, there are a whole range of ingredients within the climate system that need to come together in just the right way to produce these particularly acute extreme rainfall events to fall at that location. And when you need all of these stars to align, quite often they don't. This is what we might describe as chaos or noise or basically effectively randomness in the climate system. And what that means is even over a, a weather record of maybe 50 years, there's a decent chance, just due to chance, that you might not see a particularly extreme event occur during that period of time. Colleagues in Europe recently found that even if you take climate change out of the equation, our ability to estimate what we'd call a one in a hundred year event, or something that happens a 1% chance of happening in any given year, we had the potential to either overestimate or underestimate how much rain actually falls then, the chances of seeing that amount of rain by a factor of four depending on whether or not the historical record that we're looking at happened to see a number of remarkable or unremarkable events purely by chance. When you add on to that the fact that these events are becoming more intense due to climate change, you start to have a situation where you may have seen your worst event actually quite far in the past and a lot of years where the stars didn't align. But then when you have this new record occur, with this additional supercharging due to climate change, the margin by which this record can be broken is suddenly very large. This is what we call these record-shattering events. And it's not just the theory, but we're also seeing this in the real world. Whether you look at the 2019-20 bushfires, which hit throughout Australia, or the 2021 heatwave, which obliterated all records in British Columbia and Western North America, or indeed the August 22 monsoonal floods which devastated tens of millions of people throughout Pakistan. All of these are examples of events which locally were thought to be statistically impossible, and yet they happened. We need to start to get comfortable with the idea that looking only at data from the last couple of decades is a poor way to estimate what could happen both today but also in a future world. And yet that's kind of what we tend to do. We have notoriously short-term memories when it comes to extreme weather. And if you don't believe me, you can look at the housing market. Study after study shows, whether you're looking in New Zealand or overseas, that in the aftermath of a flooding event, house prices do temporarily dip, yes, but they tend to recover within about one to two years. OK, so what do we do then? How can we approach this? Well, the first thing is we need to learn all that we possibly can looking not only at data from the last couple of decades, but we need to look further back to the past, past historical records as well. And on top of that, we need to not only look where we live, but also pull the experiences from our neighbours around us. For example, in May 2021, we saw quite a significant flooding event impact Canterbury region. The Ashburton Bridge nearly got wiped out, and if that had happened, it would have been devastating for the economy. And yet, we only need to look a little bit further up the road and a little bit further back in time to find, you may not have heard of it, 
the May 1923 event, which devastated basically half of the east coast of the South Island. The spatial footprint of that event was about four times larger than the May 2021 event, and the records which were smashed at that time, we haven't got anywhere near close since. Now, I'm from Palmerston North, and our flooding event was the 2004 Manawatu floods. I remember going with my family to the banks of the Manawatu River, and we could see the water levels getting to within about a half a metre of breaching the banks. Now, if that had happened, hundreds of homes throughout Palmerston North would have been flooded, and the impacts would have gone into the tens, if not hundreds of millions. So we were lucky that day. That was a good news story, right? Well, yes. But we can also ask ourselves the question, what would have happened if the weather systems which produced the February 1971 floods in Taranaki and severely impacted communities there, what if that system hit a little bit further to the south and to the east? Or perhaps the conditions which produced the April 1938 floods, which had widespread impacts in southern Hawke's Bay, what if that system hit a little bit further to the south and the west? And then you add on to that, maybe another 10 or 15% to the rain which would have fallen out of those systems due to this intensification from climate change. And we start to build a physically plausible storyline of what we could see in the 21st century at this location where I'm from, the Manawatu. Okay, so uh, to be honest, that all sounds a bit doom and gloom and a bit dreary, right? <laughs> well, yes, but there's a few other things that we need to remember. The first is that the vast majority of impacts from extreme weather are actually avoidable. This is particularly true for extreme heat, but it's also true for extreme rainfall events as well. Now, Aotearoa, we actually sit on the ring of fire. We're actually really quite good at thinking about how to prepare for what scientists call low likelihood, high impact events, AKA bad stuff. We might think more about earthquakes or volcanic eruptions, we need to start putting floods into that same category as well. We need to come up with a plan of what we're going to do ahead of time and also how we're going to respond during the event with local communities well engaged, with well resourced emergency management services. And if we do that, we know that the impacts are a lot less from the same types of hazards. We can see that from comparing events which occur in different parts of the world, those places which have these systems in place versus those which don't. So resilience building, that's one thing. But that's not going to get us all the way there. The other thing we have to do is actually take agency, take ownership of the fact that we can do our bit to slow the cause of the problem. That is rising global temperatures. Now, about 15 years ago, colleagues overseas sort of had the, aha, the eureka moment that in actual fact, what we have to do to stabilise global temperatures is quite simple. Most of the greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere are long lived particularly carbon dioxide. And what that means is once we put a tonne of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it effectively stays there. And it adds additional warming to the climate. Now that simplifies things, it's quite important. Because basically what we then know is that in order for global temperatures to stabilise at some amount, whatever that might be, a requirement is for our carbon dioxide emissions to go to zero. They can't just reduce, they have to go to zero. Now, how long it takes us to get there, whether that's 2040, 2080, 2100, that's what determines what that number gets to when we stabilise. That's true of the global community as a whole, but it's actually also true of us as individuals. We can ask ourselves the question, when is it that we're going to get to net zero emissions, and what is our plan to get there? If, as a global community, we make sure that we reduce our emissions fairly rapidly, then we can make sure we keep our global temperatures stabilising, perhaps, probably not 1.5, perhaps 2, or even 2.1 degrees. But most importantly, we can avoid some of these higher warming outcomes of 3 or 3.5 degree world, where suddenly things get a little bit more difficult. Now, we know, particularly given the current rates of global temperature rise, that over the next few decades, we're going to see more and more instances where we have these extreme weather events, which at the local scale would have seemed statistically impossible, these record-shattering events. And yet, even as the climate hazards themselves worsen, the impacts don't have to. We can begin to manage these unavoidable events and the unavoidable impacts 
if we put plans in place now and prepare these resilience measures. But alongside that, we also have to make sure that we avoid the unmanageable outcomes, which are these events that we're going to see in a high warming three, three and a half degree world. It's never been either or, adaptation or mitigation. It has to be both at the same time and actually starting right now. Now, before I forget, it's important to let you know that I'm pleased to report that my sister and her family are, are safely back in their home. But next time you're sitting down after work on a Friday in the summertime, about to enjoy your cool beverage, whatever it might be, just look out on the horizon and see if there are any storm clouds brewing. It's important to keep in the back of your mind that there's a very small but growing chance that you too could see one of these extreme rainfall events where by the end of your drink, your lounge could be flooded out. If you don't have a plan to respond. And so my question is, do you know what you do in that situation? If the answer is yes, then relax, enjoy your drink. But if the answer is no, then my suggestion would be to drink up and then get to work. 